on this edition of Southern Newsweek, bells ring out to celebrate the return of albatrosses to Tairoa Head. School pupils assess water quality in rivers, and a Dunedin manufacturer of oats gives back to the public. Kia ora, good evening, I'm Melissa Barton. Dunedin resounded with bells ringing out at 1pm on Monday to mark the return of the first Northern Royal Albatross. The birds have been nesting for over 100 years at Tairoa Head, their only breeding colony on the mainland. Bells of all sorts of shapes and sizes rang out across Dunedin City yesterday in what is now an annual event marking the return of Northern Albatross to Tairoa Head. Amongst those welcoming the birds back were pupils from Broad Bay School, along with their principal, Greg McLeod. So does anyone know why are we ringing the bell at 1pm today? Uh, Who can yeah. tell me? Albatrosses. The albatrosses. Albatrosses. What's happening? The albatrosses, the albatrosses, the albatrosses, the albatrosses are flying home to breathe so that they can have their families for generations to come. The first bird back actually arrived last Wednesday and was a female going by the name of Blue Lime White. Her, her tag's Blue Lime White. Um, she's female and nine years old. Um, she hasn't actually had chicks yet, so hoping that she'll um, breed up at Tairo Head, um, and which will be really cool. Last year, the colony celebrated a hundred years since the first egg was laid in 1919. However, the first chick wasn't hatched until almost 20 years later, when school teacher Lance Richdale camped near the nest to stop people stealing the egg. Arthur Street school pupils, such as Esme Lisbeth Blacker, are aware of the historical significance of the colony. Well, Arthur Street's quite an old school, oldest in Otago, so I think it's pretty meaningful that so many albatross have come and gone since, which is pretty awesome. They leave every year, come in every year, which is pretty cool that we signify it, them coming in with the bell. And while the Northern Royal Albatross only has a toehold on the mainland, a large population of about 17,000 birds exists on the Chatham Islands. In Dunedin, the South today. Omaha school pupils had the chance to study the ecology of their local river recently. The study included looking at the presence of macroinvertebrates as an indicator of water quality. Pupils from Omoko School got to study the Manuhirakia River recently as part of their studies in water quality. They were provided with scientific equipment including a bathoscape, which was borrowed from the Otago Regional Council to help them see better underwater. We use that really to study what's going on in the, um, under the water, so in the shallows of the water because it's quite fast flowing, so we just use the bathoscope to look around on the bottom of the river to gain an understanding of whether there's any algae present um, and to have a look at what's actually happening on that stream bed as well. Because rivers and streams have water flowing through them, the environmental quality can change quickly, with either clean or polluted water entering the system. But Robinson says the presence of macroinvertebrates can show the water quality has been good for at least as long as the life cycle of the aquatic animals found in the water. An example of that is if you've got lots of your good critters like your mayflies and your dobson flies, they are there because the water quality has been good for a long period of time. Robinson says the main objective of the aquatic survey is so that both pupils and the wider community are better informed about the state of their waterways. The bigger picture of this is actually about everyone working in together, the school students, the council, the farmers and all those other interest groups working in together to provide a really healthy catchment. So the hope is, is that the students will be able to present their findings to certain groups who are interested and be able to take some really good steps to ensure that this river stays in good quality. Along with surveying macroinvertebrates, the pupils were also shown techniques to measure water flow, temperature, pH and water clarity. In Omoko, the South today. The COVID-19 lockdown earlier this year had an unexpected effect on a Dunedin business. Dunedin Oats manufacturer Haraways noticed a marked increase in sales and is now giving back to the community. 
reaping what they've sown and sharing the cream of their crop with those in need. Clearly times are tough at the moment and you know we're very much at a board and, and management level we felt there was a real opportunity for us to give back and really help those in the south because we're a you know very proud southern company. Over the next six months Haraway's plans to give more than a hundred thousand servings or 5,000 kilograms of oats to the Salvation Army for their food banks in Nelson, Christchurch, Timaru, Dunedin and Invercargill. And the initiative is really all about locals helping locals. So we're very much a, a proud oat uh, company in the south. The Salvation Army is dealing with a 300% increase in food parcel demand as people struggle with the continuing economic fallout from COVID-19. Haraway's marketing manager Peter Cox says they're not just making a one-off donation to the Salvation Army. We're looking at that over the next six months, um, so it's very much about um, a sustained level of, of support over, over six months. Statistics New Zealand figures released yesterday show the country is officially in recession, but Haraway's says they're still positive and believe they'll be trading well through the rest of the year. In Dunedin, the South Today. The government is promising $20 million from the Jobs for Nature Fund will go to conserving New Zealand's kiwi. This comes after scientists say that numbers of kiwi are declining in the wild. The wild brothers and sisters of this kiwi being admired by Conservation Minister Eugenie Sage at Dunedin's Orokinui Eco Sanctuary last year are to receive a funding boost. At a Queenstown hui on Kiwi yesterday, Sage announced that almost $20 million from the Jobs for Nature Fund will be spent on predator control to help save kiwi across New Zealand. There used to be millions of birds in New Zealand, now there are only 70,000. We have a target of rebuilding the population to 100,000 by 2030. There are community groups around 100 all around Aotearoa that are working really hard to control predators, to keep kiwi safe and to increase their chances of uh, recovering. Scientists say the number of wild kiwi is declining, with about 27 disappearing from the population each week. And Sage is hoping the public will get behind the program and also control their dogs as a loose dog can be responsible for the deaths of dozens of these vulnerable birds. New Zealanders can do their part by keeping their dogs on a lead and assisting with these community groups. She says rebuilding their numbers by 2% a year to 100,000 birds by 2030 is achievable, with several Kiwi restoration programmes already being considered a success. I'm inspired by the success stories, like with Rowie, uh, in Okurito, with the Haas Tokueka, brought back from the edge of extinction, really sustained effort through Operation Nest Egg, and those populations are increasing. Where we do the control, where there is predator control, Kiwi populations have increased. The government has allocated over a billion dollars for the Jobs for Nature Fund, aiming at creating about 2,000 jobs throughout the country over the next few years in predator control work, ecological restoration and improvements to tracks and huts. In Queenstown, the South today. Still to come up after the break on Southern Newsweek, a family celebrate the birthday of a girl who died in a car crash, and a new carving is underway at Invercargill Public Library, so see you after the break. Welcome back. A birthday barbecue and swim was held at Frankton on Monday to celebrate the birthday of an Aratown teenager who died tragically last month. Wakatabu High School pupil Alana Walker was killed in a car crash in August. Friends and family of Arrowtown teenager Alana Walker, who was tragically killed in a car crash last month, celebrated her 18th birthday with a splash yesterday. So we're all gathered here just really to, to celebrate who she was and what she, what she was all about and that was being crazy, being Alana and doing anything that wasn't 
wasn't normal. <laughs> she liked to be a little bit different, yeah. That love of being different saw Alana become known for enjoying a dip in Lake Wakatipu. Her one love was to go out and swim. doesn't matter what day, what time of the year it was, she just would jump in the lake. Her and her friends, whoever was around, and just have a great time, get out and go and carry on with life. Those attending the birthday barbecue in her memory included school friends and family, some travelling from across the South Island for the celebration. People have travelled from um, as far fairly and beyond, just, just here to just be part of her memory and, and celebrate for her today. Alana Walker was a pupil at Wakatipu High School. In Queenstown, the South today. Ashburton Airport was buzzing with several historic World War II aircraft recently. One of the planes was a Russian fighter plane capable of flying at a top speed of 600 kilometres per hour and offering 20 minute flights to the public. This World War II Russian fighter plane was giving flights to the public in Ashburton last weekend. Buying the Yak-3 was a spur of the moment decision by Blenheim man Graham Frew, whose day job has been flying Boeing 787 Dreamliners for Air New Zealand. Crazy actually, yeah. It was one of those I wish I wonder why not moments and um, I just made it work. I couldn't afford it. I bought it as a project and um, I had it restored in Blenheim over a period of time and I've been figuring out how to try and pay for it ever since. Frew's flying trips across the South Island often see him stopping in Ashburton for refuelling, as the plane can go through a whole tank in just 90 minutes. He says the support from local aviation enthusiasts was what motivated him to insert a passenger seat into the aircraft and offer 20 minute trips in the plane. We've got a great uh, aviation museum out here at Ashburton Airfield. So we hatched a plan mid-lockdown um, to um, come down and do some, uh, some flights in the aeroplane. We put a back seat in it so that we can take people for joyrides. And uh, we had uh, four very keen gentlemen wanted to go and experience what it's like to fly in a B-12 fighter plane with 1,250 horsepower up front. With a cruising speed of more than 400 kilometres per hour, a 20-minute ride can take in a lot of countryside or people can choose a more stomach churning experience. If um, the customers want to experience aerobatics, um, which is going upside down, it's like the world's best roller coaster ride, uh, then we're certainly up for doing that and showing them. And most people will give it a try. Uh, we're not into trying to scare people or make them go green. We just want them to enjoy the experience of sitting behind a, a V12 engine um, going really fast and, and maybe upside down. Other World War II aircraft on display at Ashburton over the weekend included this locally owned Tiger Moth. In Ashburton, the South today. Outdoor adventures will be more accessible for people with varying levels of mobility, thanks to a new website. Dunedin is one of the first places to be mapped on the new accessible website, which shows people the accessibility of walkways, waterways and cycleways. Making tracks more accessible for all. Dunedin is among the first cities in the country being mapped by a website set to show people of all abilities which tracks are best suited to them. Conservation Minister Eugenie Sage says the app is groundbreaking. This new uh, app or online tool and the ability uh, for tracks throughout our council uh, reserves on public conservation land to be profiled and have that information to go onto websites um, is an enormous step forward. And I really congratulate Mayor Hawkins, the Dunedin City Council, for being the first in Aotearoa to actually um, put this into practice. Announcing the website during a visit to Dunedin, Minister Sage says spending time outdoors is crucial for people's well-being, but a lack of information about accessibility is a barrier for people with mobility or disability issues. The Accessibel app will help people plan their outings. The website's been launched by Sensibel, the Department of Conservation and the Halberg Foundation. This project is accumulation of many, many years of work and collaboration from local, regional and national organisations. It's beyond wonderful actually to have you all here today. Bridget Meyer says it fits with Halberg's philosophy of we're all in this walker together. The Dunedin City Council is one of the initial funders for the project's development alongside the Central Lakes Trust 
and the New Plymouth City Council. Dunedin Mayor Aaron Hawkins says it's good to encourage people to be as active as they can be. Local government has a, a critical role to play in supporting the well-being of our communities uh, and, and, and Dunedin City Council has made uh, our social and environmental well-being uh, a priority and, and we support that in a number of ways but a couple of them uh, that are relevant today of course is in providing opportunities for people to be active in their community and providing uh, tracks and trails and supporting people being able to do that. The Accessible app gives people information about whether a track is wheelchair, pram or mobility scooter friendly before they've left the comfort of their own home, allowing them to plan for future adventures. In Dunedin, the South today. Māori culture and customs as well as the spoken word were celebrated in Invercargill recently. A display of traditional Māori carving took centre stage at the city's public library. Greg Hawkamo has kindly been given the week off from his day job. Instead, he's at the Invercargill Public Library working on this carving of Tane and his quest for the three baskets of knowledge. The carving itself talks about uh, Tane uh, and, uh, and how he went up to uh, the 12 heavens and, um, got Hokamo started carving in an access course right after he left high school and says it's an important skill for Māori to retain. It's, uh, it is really important that um, it's retained in our culture because of who we are, and mm -hmm. how we came to be. The carving is just one part of Māori Language Week celebrations at the library. And he says it's not just te reo, but also Māori culture and practice, which needs to be celebrated. I mean, say Māori, um, um, to me personally, is, uh, is, is uh, one of the best cultures in the world. Um, we've, we've achieved a lot. Um, we've come a, a very long way. Um, and um, having um, not just te reo Māori celebrated, but um, tikanga Māori as well is um, extremely important. The wooden carving is expected to take four weeks to complete and will be displayed on the wall of the library once it's completed. And in Macargill, the South today. Still to come up after the break on Southern Newsweek, some Otago Peninsula residents object to speed limit reductions and model trains are traded at an Ashburton swap meet, so see you after the break. Thanks for staying with us. The Dunedin City Council's plans to reduce speed limits on the Otago Peninsula may be scuppered. This comes after around 500 residents responded to an online survey, voicing their opposition to the idea. The Dunedin City Council is planning to cut 10 kilometres from the speed limits on many peninsula roads. But Otago Community Board Chairman Paul Pope says an online survey had about 500 respondents, with many saying no to most of the proposed speed reductions. Unilaterally they basically said no, we actually want to keep areas 70 kilometres an hour and we also want to keep our residential areas 50, so it's in, in context with the rest of the city. Over the last few years, much of the coastal road has been widened and straightened, with the creation of an additional pathway to keep pedestrians and cyclists safe. Because of the upgrades, what we've done first of all, we've created surety and safety for pedestrians, we've created safety and surety for cyclists, we've widened the road to allow it for public transport, but also for tour buses and camper vans, um, we've made the corners better, we've re-engineered some of that work as well, plus we've made it look better and, and, and more open to that. Pope says with all the improvements, it's not necessary for the speed limits to drop any further than they already have. And so people are now saying, actually we've got this safe road, why do we need to take it even further down to 60 kilometres an hour? 70 kilometres an hour is safe. Remember that wasn't that many years ago, this was a 100 kilometre an hour road, so we've gone, you know, a lot. We've done a lot of work on the infrastructure of that to make that safety. While there's been frequent minor crashes on the road, there's not been a serious harm collision for five years. In Dunedin, the South today. Cardboard pirate ships took to the slopes in the annual Pirate Day at Remarkable Ski Field last Saturday. The competitors were mostly ski field staff taking a few minutes out of their busy jobs to raise money for a good cause. 
Pirates ruled the snowfields, albeit briefly, at Queenstown's remarkable ski field on Saturday. Near the end of each season, staff find a brief window of opportunity to hastily build their not-so-sturdy cardboard chips for the annual Pirate Day run. We supply tape for them. They grab their cardboard wherever they can find it. Some of them go all the way into town. I heard a team went to speak to the manager from the warehouse to get some cardboard. And then it started last night, but all the ship got finished this morning, first thing. The winner is chosen on categories including speed, design and general pirateness, with this year's first place going to the road team. Uh, how long did it take you to build your, uh, your ship? Oh, it took us a couple, of, a couple of days, lad. We're quick on the hammer and faster on the seven seas. And what was the trick to winning? The trick to winning was to have faith in yourself and faith in your team. Final words? Final words? Squids and rum. Happy days. Thank you. As well as providing staff with a quick break off work, the event raises money for the Remarkables Adaptive Programme, which helps people with disabilities to fully enjoy Queenstown's winter experience. It's always good to see the effort that the staff put. They only have a few minutes to do that. Uh, they gather, they take break to go build their ship and all of that. They're all going back to work right away now, so yeah, it's a great event. Ten teams entered this year, with one crewed by people from outside the ski field. In Queenstown, the south today. Model railway enthusiasts missed out on the annual Ashburton Model Train Show this year. So instead, locals organised a swap meet for people to buy and sell all sorts of items related to model railways. The annual Ashburton Model Train Show, which was scheduled for July, had to be cancelled this year due to COVID-19 restrictions. So instead the club organised a swap meet, with also a couple of tracks in action, but mostly aimed at helping enthusiasts sell or swap their models. We got our heads together and decided we'd put on the swap meet because we had to cancel the normal model train show earlier this year. So we thought we'd do this instead. It's the first time a swap meet has been held in Ashburton, with everything from engines, carriages, tracks and scenery up for grabs. Oh, there's things that start at a dollar and then there's things up into the hundreds of dollars. Um, when you've got bigger uh, scale of um, trains or the garden railway type stuff, that's hundreds of dollars for a you know, set. People came from all over the Lower South Island for this one day only opportunity to buy and sell model railway items. Very, very positive response. Uh, we're actually overwhelmed with the number of people that have um, wanted sales tables to sell their um, model train bits and pieces. The swap meet was held at the Plains and Historical Museum on Sunday. In Ashburton, the South today. And that wraps up this edition of Southern News Week. For the latest news from the Southern region, head online to odt.co.nz and follow Channel 39 on YouTube and Facebook. Thanks for watching. Kakite ano. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.